everyone, it's Katrina. Nazis in the jungle. In the middle of the lush Argentinian jungle, explorers have found evidence of a secret Nazi base. Argentina was known as a pro-Nazi country during the 1940s. They were major Nazi sympathizers and helped many German high commanders in the war's aftermath. That's not to say everyone of Argentina supported this, but the government back in the days of World War II certainly did. There have always been stories about secret Nazi bunkers hiding deep in the Andean jungle far from prying eyes. And finally, researchers with the University of Buenos Aires have discovered one. Hidden in an isolated pocket of a provincial park in Teyucuare, three buildings have been found along with artifacts that appear to link whoever lived in the buildings to top Nazi leaders. Inside these strange jungle fortifications, the researchers found German coins, porcelain plates from Germany, and even items with swastikas. The mysterious site is located just 10 minutes from the border with Paraguay, and although the buildings could have been used by anyone, they seem to be linked directly to Nazis. We don't know who lived here. Rumors are it could have been Adolf Eichmann and his loyal Nazi friends trying to live in isolation. It's hard to say because the ruins are mostly destroyed, and other than the few artifacts, there's nothing else really of importance found inside. The research team stresses that the site could have been planned to be used by some other group than the Nazis. Its assumptions are not final. An article published in Argentina's Clarín notes that officials from the Simon Weisenthal Center and the Buenos Aires Holocaust Museum find the theory captivating, but will spare judgment until the findings are more abundantly accepted. Maya Noblewoman Researchers who work for the Chiapas branch of Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History identified the remains of an ancient Maya noblewoman. She was found in the Palenque Archaeological Zone, which was once a key Maya territory. The discovery was made while a new restroom area was being constructed on-site for tourists. As crews were digging to install the toilet, about six feet deep beneath the surface, the same distance people are still buried, they unearthed a grave. And in that grave, they found the skeletal remains of a woman. The ancient city-state of Palenque was important to the Maya Empire and one of their prime regional centers. The women buried in this grave probably died just before the end of the 8th century AD, pretty close to when the Maya Empire disintegrated. And because she was found in an extravagant tomb, buried with some artifacts made of obsidian, she was probably a woman of some renown. Her burial was far from simple. It includes a type of tomb known as a cyst, which is a sturdy container made of carefully carved stone blocks. She may have been a member of the city-state's ruling elite, it could have been a lawmaker or some kind of government agent, or maybe the wife of someone of great importance. All we know is that she was part of the ruling class associated with the administrative body of this ancient jungle kingdom. Another clue was the presence of jade stone inlays on some of the woman's teeth. This type of inlay would have only been made available to people of high status, with the means to pay for superior medical and dental services. Along with the elaborate tomb, they also found signs that a stone workshop had once been in the same estimated location. In the ground above and around the tomb, they also extracted pieces of ceramic pottery and stone tools of several types. For now, the team isn't certain if there is any link between the other items and the tomb or the important women buried here. Mad Honey there are over 300 varieties of honey that can be found across this beautiful planet, and yet one specific honey is far stranger than any other. It's also the most dangerous, and quite literally, the most insane. It's called mad honey, and it's a rare hallucinogen which can be harvested in mountainous regions such as those around the Black Sea and on the slopes of mountains in Nepal and Turkey. This honey is produced by bees who feed on a very specific species of rhododendron plant. Eating the honey in small doses can cause feelings of euphoria, while higher doses can cause major hallucinations and even loss of life. Even though mad honey is illegal in most countries, it's still harvested today, and some jungle dwellers still are able to eat it. The honey is redder and slightly more bitter in taste, and comes from the world's largest honeybee, Apis dorsata laboriosa. According to David Caprara from Vice News, who journeyed to Nepal to try this honey for himself, Two teaspoons gives a feeling similar to smoking a lot of marijuana. It's kind of body high. He said it makes you feel calm and warm, with a funny tingling sensation in the back of the head. This happens not because of the bees themselves, but because of the rhododendrons. 
These types of plants contain neurotoxic compounds. When bees feed on the nectar, they unintentionally ingest these neurotoxic compounds, and through nature, they seep into the honey of the bees. And so, beehives throughout Nepal, or at least in this part of Nepal, are filled with liquid mad honey, one of the weirdest hallucinogenic substances in the world. While fascinated consumers in the US can buy mad honey from countries like Nepal and Turkey, it's probably a good idea to stick with the regular sticky stuff. There were a few experiences posted on the website of the nonprofit psychedelic research organization Arrowid.org that didn't sound too great. It's shout out time! Big thank you to Big Doug and Mandy Lynn Review for supporting this channel! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family! Sea Monster in the Jungle a man named Chim Samarithi was strolling through the Cambodian jungle when he came across a sea monster. Not a real living, breathing sea monster, but a statue of one carved into a large rock. This man was wandering through the Phnom Kulin National Park in the province of Siem Reap. This isn't too far from the famous Angkor Wat, which is a temple complex in Cambodia and it's the largest religious monument in the world. As he was wandering, he came across the face of a massive beast known to the Khmer as a Makara. It's a legendary sea monster from Hindu mythology, but its presence in the middle of the jungle seemed quite absurd. Archaeologists were called to the site the next day, where they identified the statue as being from the 6th century. That makes it roughly 1,500 years old. The rest of the sea monster was in fragments, broken into 13 pieces scattered across the jungle floor. Strangely, archaeologists couldn't find anything to suggest there had ever been a temple close by. There was no evidence to show any other structure had been here, meaning the statue was by itself. 1,500 years ago, somebody carved a sea monster out of a rock in the jungle, and experts don't have a clue why. Maya Divination Calendar In Guatemala, scientists have just discovered the oldest evidence of a Maya calendar on record. The discovery was made deep in the Central American jungle and consists of only two small fragments of stone. These fragments were once part of a mural and when pieced together form a Maya notation called Seven Deer. The two fragments of the mural date to around the year 300 BC and 200 BC. This is according to the official radiocarbon dating done by the scientists who discovered it. Judging by the date, we can safely say this was a Maya divination calendar something which was also used by other cultures of Mesoamerica. Even the Aztec used this kind of calendar, and the modern Maya use a similar calendar today. Communities of Maya people in Guatemala use the old divination calendars as a way of keeping connected to their ancestors and preserving their history. The fragments were discovered at the site of San Bartolo, which is located somewhat close to the ancient city of Tikal. Only the site of San Bartolo was only discovered by modern scientists deep in the remote jungle back in 2001. Researchers believe it was a major city between 400 BC and 280 AD. The fragmented pieces of the mural form a deer glyph underneath the Maya symbol for the number 7. We know it's old because the deer glyph was actually drawn using a deer head instead of just writing the word deer, like the Maya did with later calendars. This proves the artifacts are from an archaic calendar, one of the first ever used by the Maya to keep track of ceremonies. Ruins in the Bolivian Amazon Unbelievable ruins of Amazonian settlements have recently been found in the jungles of Bolivia. These settlements were once home to a society of advanced humans living in the Amazon who practiced agriculture. These people enjoyed cosmology, had a surprisingly sophisticated understanding of the cosmos, and lived all throughout the jungle hundreds and even thousands of years before Europeans showed up. Archaeologists found 26 different sites spread across a large region in the north part of the jungle. This is further proof that the Amazon was home to massive settlements and extremely complex societies. According to archaeologist Heiko Plumers, we need to accept the fact that these parts of the Amazon were densely populated during pre-Hispanic times. There's just no denying it. Unfortunately, there's nothing left of these sites now except for the imprint they made on the jungle floor. Researchers only found them because they use lasers mounted on helicopters to scan underneath the canopy of trees. That was how they identified the lost settlements, which were active from between roughly 500 and 1400 AD. We don't know why these settlements were abandoned, where the people went, or how long exactly they had been living there. But the Amazon was a bustling place when the people suddenly disappeared and the jungle swallowed their cities. The Janglot Jungle Beasts 
The Janglot is a humanoid creature that allegedly lives in the jungles of Indonesia. It looks like a small, mutated person. It was discovered in 1997 on the island of Java, and yet even all these years later, scientists aren't sure if the creature was a hoax or if it's a genuine being. But one thing's for sure, many Indonesians who live in the remote Javanese jungle believe it exists and that the creature has mystical powers. The creature can supposedly be found in all sorts of places, underground, in tree trunks, or even on the roofs of houses. It's only a few inches tall, maybe a foot at most, with spooky long black hair, extra long fingernails like wolverine claws, and vampire fangs. Some say the Jenglot feeds on blood, and the owner has to feed it daily. Others say it can hide in a town and cause misfortune to those around it. And a few say the Jenglot is actually a man who had practiced forbidden magic attempting to gain immortality. Whatever the case, nobody has ever actually found proof that the Jenglot exists. Sure, dead Jenglots have been on display at temporary exhibitions in Indonesia and Malaysia, but these corpses have never been studied by scientists. Do you think they could be real? Peruvian Walled City 1300 years ago, a mysterious culture in Peru inhabited a great jungle city. These people were eventually conquered by the Inca, and their names were lost to history. But now, explorers from the US and Peru have uncovered their strange walled city, the complex deep in Peru's Amazon jungle. It took a month of trekking through the forest, climbing up rainy hills and high craggy cliffs, and descending long, twisting valleys. But they finally found the city, once home to 10,000 people. The stone city is 3,000 meters above sea level. That's just a little higher than the Golden Gate Bridge is long. It's kind of like Machu Picchu because it's so high up. Only this city is still shrouded in jungle foliage. The place is enormous, made up of five citadels stretching over 101 square kilometers. That's about the size of San Francisco. It was once protected by high curtain walls, although now the place is in pretty rough shape. According to the researchers, the city was probably occupied by the Chachapoyas culture. They differed greatly from other Peruvian cultures in that they had fair skin. These people were extremely tall and preferred living in the jungle rather than near Peru's coastline. But before the Spanish ever showed up, the Inca and the Chachapoyas went to war, and the Inca won. Researchers also found a small Inca settlement within the borders of the jungle city validating they had probably conquered the place. The Abandoned Jungle Hotel In Rio de Janeiro, in full view of the Atlantic Ocean, there is a massive abandoned hotel sitting in the tropical jungle. It hides in dense foliage, high on a mountain overlooking the sea. The building is known as the Skeleton Hotel, and it's been abandoned for almost 50 years. The construction of this creepy jungle hotel started in 1953. It was designed to be a luxurious tourist resort where foreigners could get a real slice of paradise outside the noise of the city. But after almost 20 years, construction was interrupted because the company went bankrupt. The result was 16 floors of empty rooms, unfinished walls, an elevator shaft with no elevator, and long flights of stairs that led to nowhere. The Skeleton Hotel, a somewhat primitive shelter in the jungle, quickly became a refuge for the homeless and the criminal element of Brazil. And while it's certainly possible to trek through the jungle and find this decrepit ruin in the middle of a tropical paradise, you just never know who else might be lurking inside. The Monster of Belize 27,000 years ago, a thirsty giant ground sloth was wandering around in Belize. Back then, the country wasn't the hot and humid jungle it is today. That's because there was somewhat of an ice age going on, with most of the liquid on the planet locked up at the polar ice caps. Belize wasn't a jungle, it was an arid desert. And so the giant ground sloth was having a really difficult time tracking down water to satisfy its thirst. It ended up coming across a deep sinkhole with steep walls just like a natural well. The sloth, which stood somewhere around 16 feet tall, about the size of a giraffe, leaned in close to take a drink, and that was when it fell in, drowned, and sank to the bottom of the sinkhole. Fast forward almost 30,000 years, Belize isn't a dry desert, it's a hot, sweaty jungle, but the exact same sinkhole is in the same spot. And in 2014, divers found the bones of our thirsty giant ground sloth fossilized at the bottom of the pool in Carablanca. They uncovered parts of a tooth, some pieces of bone from its arm, and a fully intact leg bone. Scientists believe giant ground sloths went extinct about 10,000 years ago, or 17,000 years after our thirsty sloth died. 
And since humans arrived in Central America about 13,000 years ago, that means there was a 3,000 year period in which humans and these giant beasts interacted with one another. Some scientists say it was human migration to the Western Hemisphere that resulted in the extinction of these giant, very slow, and very easy to catch animals. Thanks for watching! What mysterious creature from the jungle do you think might actually exist? Blackbeard's Cannon An amazing piece of history was recently pulled up from the waters near Beaufort, North Carolina. The relic that had been lost in time came from the legendary ship of the pirate known as Blackbeard. An actual cannon from the infamous pirate's last ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, was brought up from the sea, covered in barnacles. Weighing over 2,000 pounds, it once helped terrorize the seas. The discovery was made by researchers with the Queen Anne's Revenge Project, part of an effort to secure artifacts from Blackbeard's sunken ships. So far, they have found about 280,000 artifacts from various wrecks, most pretty small. This gun was a major discovery simply for its size. It's about 8 feet long, and according to historians, the last people to have looked at it were real breathing pirates. The cannon is pretty incredible, but only one piece of a much larger puzzle. Archaeologists have also uncovered medical supplies, dishes from the ship, gold dust from lost treasure, the shackles of prisoners, jewelry from Africa, and a small cache of pirate weapons. The ship itself was originally a French slave ship called La Concorde, but Blackbeard stole it. It was a very powerful ship, able to fight off the navy with 40 cannons and plenty of room for cargo and pirates. Blackbeard loved to scare his victims, and this ship was very intimidating. He used it for about six months to terrorize the Atlantic, taking whatever he wanted. He also blockaded the port of Charleston for a week before they were able to pay him off. But in 1718, the ship hit a sandbar near the Beaufort Inlet. Later that year, Blackbeard was taken down by members of the Royal Navy of Virginia, and his most prized ship was gone. It wasn't until 1996 that the famous ship was found again, the Wida Galley Skeletons. The Wida Galley was a ship from the Golden Age of Piracy, dating back hundreds of years. The ship was commanded by Captain Samuel Bellamy, who was born in England in 1689, then moved to Massachusetts in 1715. You may know him under a different name, Black Sam. After he moved to Massachusetts, allegedly to find lost relatives, Samuel Bellamy took up with a group of sailors to hunt for the lost treasure of the 1715 Spanish fleet. These were ships that had gotten caught in a hurricane off Florida's coast and sank, filled to the brim with gold and jewels. Samuel never found the treasure, but it didn't matter. Turns out he was a great pirate and started looting merchant ships in the Bahamas. By the summer of 1716, he had already taken 53 ships and earned himself the title of the wealthiest pirate captain in history. On April 17, 1717, the Wida Galley got stuck in a fog off the coast of Massachusetts and hit a sandbar. The boat capsized, all but six people were killed, and Black Sam's precious vessel sank to the bottom of the sea. And there it sat undisturbed for 260 years. The explorer Barry Clifford found its remains in 1984, and since then, he has excavated over 200,000 pieces of the ship, including priceless artifacts. More recently, researchers discovered the skeletons of six dead pirates, including a leg bone they believe could belong to Black Sam. In 2018, DNA analysis revealed one of the femurs they found belonged to a crew member of Eastern Mediterranean descent. They haven't actually connected Bellamy to the leg bone yet, but they are hoping to do so soon. Captain Kidd's Treasure Underwater explorers have discovered the treasure of the notorious 17th century pirate Captain Kidd. They found it off the coast of Madagascar, in the waters of St. Marie. Not all the treasure was found, just a single silver bar weighing roughly 9 pounds. But that's a pretty impressive bar of pure silver. It was presented to the president of Madagascar, and nothing more has been discovered just yet. But experts such as Barry Clifford, who found both the piece of silver and Sam Bellamy's ship, say the silver bar is just the beginning. It most likely came from Kidd's ship, the Adventure Galley, and it's believed there are lots more silver bars. Captain Kidd, also known as William Kidd, was appointed by British authorities to take down the pirate menace in the late 17th century. But instead of doing that, 
he simply took out some of the competition and became a ruthless pirate himself. He was captured by the British and then executed in 1701. Legend has it that he left behind an enormous treasure. And even though the location of Kidd's ship, which sank in 1698, has been common knowledge for many years, the treasure has never been found. Barry Clifford just so happened to be using his metal detector underwater when it picked up the silver. The bulk of the treasure probably spilled out of the broken ship and is now strewn hundreds of feet beneath the ocean's surface in every direction, making the pieces nearly impossible to collect. Pirates in the Vatican A shocking tale of treasure, a pope, and a horrifying pirate was recently discovered in the Vatican archives. You've probably heard of these archives before the secret repository of every important piece of information since the medieval days stored in Vatican City. And while most of the information is catalogued, new things are found occasionally. And recently, a new document from the archives was published discussing this bizarre tale of piracy. According to the document, the incident took place in the early part of 1357. The Sal Vicente, a vessel filled with the treasure of a dead bishop, set sail from Lisbon in Portugal. It had a cargo of gold and silver, jewels and tapestries, and all kinds of religious treasures. These treasures had belonged to the late Bishop of Lisboa, Thibaut de Castellón. The ship was on its way to France to deliver the goods, but while sailing past Cartagena, Spain, the ship was attacked by a pair of pirate vessels. One of them was commanded by Antonio Firefart. Yep, that was his name, Firefart. He was actually called Antonio Botafoc, but Botafoc translates to either fire blast or fire fart, and nobody knows his real name. Anyways, sadly for the pirate fire fart, after he and his crew escaped with the treasure, they ran aground near the small town of Agues Mortes in France. The local militia captured the pirates and hung them right there on the beach. Pirates in the schoolyard. A human skeleton was found underneath a playground at a school in Scotland. Researchers say the skeleton may have once been a living, breathing pirate from the 16th century. The human remains were discovered by city workmen at the Victoria Primary School in Edinburgh. Experts carbon dated the bones to the 16th century. But how did researchers figure out the bones belonged to a pirate? That's the more gruesome part of the story. This primary school, where kids play and learn, was once the site of a gibbet. Instead of a playground, there was a crude wooden platform in which the corpses of executed pirates were displayed to the general public as a warning not to follow in their footsteps. Nobody can say for sure who this individual was, but experts can make a solid guess based on the fact he was most likely a criminal, the proximity of the gibbet to the harbor, and the time of death. They say this was almost definitely a pirate convicted of crimes on the high seas. Cannon fodder. New evidence has come to light about the scary battle tactics pirates use thanks to the investigation into Blackbeard's wreck off the coast of North Carolina. Archaeologists from North Carolina's Department of Cultural Resources found three metallic clusters on the seabed. The three clusters are basically masses of lead shot, nails, and glass. But what were they used for? Researchers believe these materials were jammed into canvas bags and then fired out of cannons. We would call these cluster bombs. Instead of firing giant cannonballs, Blackbeard often employed terror tactics. He stuffed his cannons full of glass and nails like some anarchist in his basement making homemade nail bombs. He then fired them out of his cannons to frighten his enemies. The hope was that they would give up their ship without Blackbeard having to destroy it. But when it came to destroying ships, Blackbeard also had a tool for that. He used two cannonballs connected by a long iron chain. When shot from a cannon, the two balls would spin through the air and snap apart the rigging of the enemy ship, causing panic and chaos. Arabian Coins Some of the oldest coins ever discovered in the United States of America are actually Arabic from the Middle East. A handful of these ancient coins was recently found at a fruit orchard in rural Rhode Island. And it wasn't the only time a random collection of old Arabic coins was discovered in New England. It's happened repeatedly, and historians say it all has to do with one particularly ruthless pirate. Jim Bailey is an amateur historian who recently came across a 17th century Arabian coin in a meadow in Middleton using his metal detector. 
He believes the ancient pocket change came from a murderous English pirate, a man named Captain Henry Every. Henry Every was once the most wanted criminal in the world, all because he plundered a ship full of Muslim pilgrims. It was on September 7, 1695. Captain Every ambushed a royal vessel called the Ganj e Sawai, which was owned by the Indian Emperor Aurangzeb. He was one of the most powerful emperors of the 17th century. The people on board the ship were returning from their pilgrimage to Mecca, but the ship also happened to contain gold and silver worth upwards of tens of millions of dollars. It was one of the most lucrative pirate robberies in history, but it was also brutal. The captain killed all the men on board, disposed of the women, and then escaped to the Bahamas. But when word spread about their horrible crimes, they had to flee. Even by pirate standards, they were considered barbaric. And until now, historians had no idea where he went. But considering the coins from the robbery ended up in New England, it looks like that was exactly where Every and his crew escaped to. And since they were never caught, it's presumed they lived a life of luxury in the New World as some of America's first seriously wealthy criminals. Blackbeard's Book Club I told you about Blackbeard's cannon and cluster bombs he used to terrify his enemies, but now it's time to look at Blackbeard's Book Club. As it turns out, Blackbeard wasn't just a vicious criminal. He may have also had an interest in literature. Conservators in North Carolina recently discovered paper fragments from the wreckage of his flagship, the Queen Anne's Revenge. These paper fragments were stuffed into the back of a cannon in a big glob. They were identified as pages that had been torn out of a seafaring adventure book called A Voyage to the South Sea Around the World, first edition published in 1712. This book was actually the inspiration for the much more popular Robinson Crusoe that came after. Nobody is exactly sure who owned the book. Since it was found stuffed into the back of a cannon, it really could have been anyone. It may have been part of the library of the merchant ship Margaret, pillaged by Blackbeard. Or it could have been one of his very own books. Or maybe it belonged to one of his crew members. But here's the interesting thing. The book is about Woods Rogers, the first British governor of the Bahamas. The book goes into detail about his expedition, but also talks about his crackdown on piracy. Eric Farrell with the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources says the book may have been ripped apart by an angry crew member. This crew member may have started reading it and then didn't agree with Roger's disapproval of pirates, getting so mad he stuffed the pages into a cannon. The Skeedum In 2018, professional diver David Gibbons with Cornwall Maritime Archaeology came across a pirate cannon sitting on a rocky ledge off the coast of England. He found it just a few hundred feet from the beach. It was revealed thanks to a recent storm shifting around the sediment. David says the cannon is part of the wreckage of the ship the Skeedum, which was captured by pirates before later being seized by the Royal Navy in the 17th century. The cannon, which is still underwater, is about 340 years old. But the cannon wasn't the only thing waiting to be discovered here. The string of storms also revealed the remnants of timbers from the ship, as well as lost cargo. A box of pirate hand grenades was discovered, as well as a crate full of ornamental marble. The ship itself was originally a Dutch merchant vessel, captured in 1683 by Barbary pirates. The pirates failed to keep the ship, it was seized by the British, and then used as a transport vessel. It was packed with arms and ammunition from the failed British colony in Morocco, when it ran aground during a storm in April of 1684. The ship went down near Church Cove and was lost for over three centuries. Nothing has actually been recovered yet, nothing salvaged or brought to the surface, but David did manage to take so many pictures that he created a 3D image of the wreck site, showing how the ship has decayed over the centuries. Washed up in February of 2022, a piece of history washed itself right up onto the shores of North Carolina. It was a piece of a sunken ship from the 1800s, and it ended up on the beachfront of Bald Head Island. The tide brought it in, and then it got stuck on the sand. Interestingly enough, nobody actually knows what kind of ship this was. It could have been a merchant vessel, it could have been a pirate ship, and it could have even been used during a war. Nothing is left of it except a few chunks of wood with iron nails sticking out. Even though we can't definitively call this a pirate ship, there is no way to confirm it's not a pirate ship either. 
The fact is that the ocean surrounding North Carolina is basically an underwater graveyard. Historians estimate there could be 3,000 ships sunk just off the coast, many dating back to the first European settlers and to the golden age of piracy. Not far from where this washed up, Blackbeard ships are still sitting underwater. Moonhole Mansion At the western end of the island of Bekia in the Caribbean is the Moonhole Mansion, an abandoned estate built inside a volcanic arch. A retired couple built the walls of their new dream home into the volcanic rock. The ocean waves crash up against its foundation and through the open windows. It's one of the most beautiful abandoned mansions anywhere in the world, sitting at the bottom of a steep Caribbean cliff. It looks like a lost piece of paradise. Its origins aren't as old as you might think. In the late 1950s, Tom and Gladie Johnston retired and moved to the island. The island was a lovely paradise of sand and trees. There were no hotel chains because the rock stars of the day preferred the southern island of Moustique. Tom and Gladie had the brilliant idea of building a mansion inside the bizarre volcanic formation that the locals called the Moonhole. But there were some major problems. Tom was not an architect and did not know how to build a mansion. There was the constant threat of rocks breaking off from the formation and crashing through the ceiling. There was also the tide to worry about. They built the mansion anyway, and it became one of the most interesting houses in the world. But the mansion was too unsafe, so the couple had to move out. Tom died in 2001, and now island authorities have condemned the broken down empty place. They won't allow anyone inside, because at any moment the whole place could come crashing down and slide into the water. Roman Ghost City El Oued is called the Town of a Thousand Domes, a city in the Algerian oasis. It's in the middle of the northern Sahara, about 50 miles from the border of Tunisia. It's surrounded by hostile sand dunes, but it's still a thriving city. Outside the occupied city is a vast and ruthless desert riddled with ghost towns. Throughout ancient history, settlers built dozens and even hundreds of small towns in the desert and then abandoned them. Most towns are nameless, and the desert sands have completely swallowed many of them. The unforgiving sand has inched closer and closer to the flourishing oasis over the past few centuries. But there is one city, one great abandoned metropolis in Algeria, which still stands today. It's called Timgad, and it was once occupied by the Romans. It's right on the edge of the Sahara Desert and went unnoticed by civilization for hundreds of years. Today, it's one of the best examples of Roman town planning anywhere in the empire, because time hasn't altered it over thousands of years. Its ruins poke out of the North African desert sands, covering 123 acres. It wasn't until the 1950s that archaeologists finally dug it out of the sand, much to their shock and delight. What makes it fascinating is that it has the earliest grid street system in the world. Thanks to archaeologists, we know Emperor Trajan originally founded the city in 100 AD. He had it built as a retirement colony for soldiers living in Africa. It expanded to hold about 10,000 residents. But because of its place in the inhospitable desert, and because of the fall of the Roman Empire, it was abandoned. The region is so barren that nobody ever went back to rebuild, and the desert swallowed it for nearly 2,000 years. Egidium Theater on a busy street in Brussels, Belgium, there is a stunning abandoned movie theater called the Egidium. The original owner had the building constructed in 1906 and opened its doors to the public under the name the Diamant Palace. At first, the new owner had the building specifically designed to host parties. But when he died, the new owner took over and renamed it the Pantheon Palace. It then hosted dance nights until 1929, when it changed owners again and he renamed it the Egidium. Renovations took place in 1933, turning the former dance hall into a movie theater. It was a tremendous success for 50 years, but in 1979, the owner turned the movie theater into a day center. Six days after that, its doors closed because it had fallen into such awful condition. There have been attempts to rejuvenate the building and bring it back to life, but all those attempts have failed. The building needs serious money and renovations to open again, and nobody seems interested in putting that money up. What we have now is an abandoned building from the early 1900s, 
a bizarre mix of Art Nouveau and old Moorish-style architecture. It might be pretty, but it's way too dangerous to go inside. Major Gristmill The Major Gristmill can be found in Valdez, North Carolina. Just like the movie theater, it was also built in 1906. The founders built it to serve the local community by grinding up corn and wheat. But a terrible flood came in 1916 and destroyed the water wheel. Losing the wheel forced the mill to use turbine power, but this was ineffective, and the owner shut down the mill in the 1940s. Also, it couldn't be operated alone, and World War II was calling many of the young men in the community to serve their country. All these years later, the mill is still standing. It's next to the beautiful McGalliard Falls, one of the most breathtaking natural splendors in North Carolina. In 1982, the mill was renovated and in 2016, the original water wheel was replaced. Sadly, none of the machinery works, and the mill is a historical landmark deep in the McGalliard Falls Park. The only people who visit now are tourists and locals who like to walk their dogs in the beautiful scenery. Have you ever been there before? Let us know in the comments below. The 1984 Winter Olympics Sarajevo, Bosnia hosted the 1984 Winter Olympics. The government put up a lot of money to build the stadiums, slopes, and other buildings. It was an enormous investment for the nation, with loads of infrastructure being built to accommodate the Olympians. But civil war tore Sarajevo apart shortly after the Olympics. The conflict ravaged the city, killed thousands of civilians, and decimated the venues of the Winter Olympics. The venues are now abandoned and look like they could be used as the backdrop for a dystopian movie. Bosnia was the first communist state to hold the Winter Olympics. They were part of Yugoslavia, but from 1992 to 1995, Yugoslavia split apart into independent nations, such as Bosnia and Serbia. It was during the breakup that the city abandoned the Olympic venues. Soldiers used the track as an artillery stronghold during the siege of the city. And all these years later, nobody has bothered to reclaim them. There is graffiti on just about every surface of the concrete in the abandoned Olympic Village. There are bullet holes in the ski jumps. An enormous billboard with nothing on it is now blocking the end of one of those jumps. And at ground level, the medals podium is even still standing, although it is heavily decayed. The whole place is in a state of collapse, overgrown with weeds and gradually being reclaimed by Mother Nature. Belchite the ancient Spanish town of Belchite found itself in a difficult situation during the Spanish Civil War, which was fought between 1936 and 1939. For a bit of historical background, the war happened because fascist generals in the Spanish army revolted against the government. They thought they could do a quick takeover, but it spiraled out of control. Spanish rebels rose up against them, local armies organized and started fighting, and it was a gigantic mess for the Spanish government. It was socialists, communists, republicans, and anarchists fighting against the fascists, and the fascists won in 1939. The town of Belchite sat right on the front lines controlled by the fascist army. Then the republican army took it, and they blew it apart in the fighting. Journalist Cecil D. Abey described Belchite as less of a town and more of a nasty smell. It was a heap of rubble, corpses, and flies. Surviving residents completed a new town in 1954 and left the old one as is. It still looks the same as it did in 1939. It's still a pile of rubble, but officials removed and buried all of the bodies. Worcester State Hospital The Worcester State Hospital is one of the creepiest abandoned asylums anywhere in the United States. And that's saying something considering just how many creepy mental hospitals there are dotting the country. It's in Worcester, and it's the oldest asylum anywhere in Massachusetts. It opened its doors on January 12, 1833, under the name Worcester Insane Asylum. During the first year of its operations, doctors brought 164 patients in for treatment. Healing back then meant lobotomies and shock therapy. It soon became clear that the staff and patients needed a bigger facility. The state began construction on a new asylum in 1870 and finished in 1876. This would be the Worcester State Hospital. It was state-of-the-art, designed by the English architect Frank W. Weston. As with most hospitals in the United States, as the number of patients grew, so did overcrowding. The state added new buildings up until 1958, but it was around this time that new medications and treatments for the mentally ill became more available and accepted. 
The original insane asylum was obsolete by 1985 and closed down. The building was empty, and in 1991, it was partially destroyed by a fire. There is nothing left of it today except the original administration building from the early 1800s. It's a historical landmark now, with the new Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital built right in front of it. Edelweiss Village The small hamlet of Edelweiss began its life as a retreat for Swiss mountain guides. Now it's deserted. Investors built the town in British Columbia back in the 1910s during a boom of mountain exploration. Swiss guides moved from Europe to Canada to help tourists get through the Rocky Mountains. It was extremely popular back then, but not exactly the bee's knees anymore. The fad grew out of style. Nobody needed the town anymore. The mountain guides all moved to the more popular town of Golden, and the entire village was deserted. It's located in the Alpine countryside with buildings. It's meant to mimic traditional European houses and could be one of the most gorgeous towns anywhere in the country, but there isn't a single person living in it. The town was empty by the 1950s. You probably could have purchased one of these gorgeous houses for a sack of potatoes. Just a decade ago, you could have bought the whole town for next to nothing, but with the recent boom in real estate, even a deserted town like this is worth a fortune. Just recently, the abandoned town of Edelweiss sold for a modest $1.8 million. That's not too bad, especially considering the properties come with 50 acres of pristine wilderness. Chicago Coke Plant The Acme Steel Chicago Coke Plant is an abandoned industrial wasteland covering 100 acres of polluted countryside. Once upon a time, the plant here produced coke for blast furnaces. Coke is basically coal but transformed through the process of coking. The plant operated by making products like tar, ammonia, and light oil. After roughly a century of operations, the Acme steel plant shut down in 2001 for unknown reasons. What's bizarre is that current records show the plant has no actual owner. It's an abandoned piece of real estate and nobody owns it. Not to mention, the soil is toxic. There are chemicals in the soil surrounding the plant that are a serious risk to anyone who enters the facility, especially children. This is according to state health officials in a 2007 report. Right now, we do not know what's going to happen with this gigantic piece of polluted land. The Chicago Southeast Environmental Task Force wants the land to be cleaned up and repurposed, but that could take a lot of money and over a decade. And so the place remains as it has for the last 20 years a toxic modern ruin. Spree Park Spree Park in Berlin, Germany has been abandoned for approximately 20 years. The park is trashed, filled with strange remnants of its days as an amusement park after World War II. The socialist government of East Berlin originally constructed it in 1969, and it stood as a functional communist theme park until the Berlin Wall came down 20 years later. During the communist era of Berlin, the park had roughly 1.7 million visitors a year. There were all kinds of rides, outlandish attractions, and even a Ferris wheel. Part of its popularity was because there was no other amusement park in East Germany to visit. After the wall came down, an amusement park operator by the name of Norbert Witt took over ownership. This was in 1991. He installed rides he had bought from other abandoned parks in Paris, changed the scenery, added an English village, and he smuggled cocaine. That's right, Norbert brought cocaine into Germany through pieces of equipment being shipped to him from Peru. He could fit a lot of drugs inside amusement park pieces, and it made him a fortune. But because of his criminal activities, poor visitor numbers, and general disinterest, he was forced to shut the park down in 2002. German courts tried Norbert on smuggling charges two years later. Ever since then, the park has been decaying. The fire destroyed many of its most popular features in 2014, and in 2019, most of the rest of the attractions were removed. The only thing that still stands are the Ferris wheel and some creepy abandoned restaurants. Oh yeah, and the cup carousel is still there for some reason, all grown over with weeds. Thanks for watching. Which of these abandoned places did you find the most fascinating? Which one would you like to visit? Let me know in the comments below and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time. Bye.